It is for those kinds of concern reasons that people will say, and you hear the ads on TV all the or on the radio, and you see them on TV all the time, oh, why don't we do an irrevocable trust or an irrevocable trust? We'll use irrevocable today. As we've said before, you can use it either way. I looked it up in the dictionary. You can say it either way. What if you do an irrevocable trust and you transfer your assets to it? Are those assets then safe? And the answer is maybe. But we're going to talk about this, okay? First of all, what is an irrevocable trust? An irrevocable trust, amazingly enough, is a trust that can't be revoked, right? It is not a trust that can't be amended, just a trust that can't be revoked. In other words, the person who is creating the trust and putting the money into it can't say at some point, I revoke the trust, which means that all the money comes back. That's different from having a provision in the trust that says if the trust terminates, and so and so is going to get it, and so and so is going to, my children are going to get it, etc. The, the person who creates the trust and funds it has the legal power, unless they say that they don't, right in the document, to revoke that trust and take everything back. So it has to be irrevocable, but it can be amendable, right? And it can have Mary and or Mary Jr. or anybody else. She could have me on there too, you know, but she, I, I never get named, but so she could have, she could have her children on as beneficiaries. Right? Or she could be a beneficiary, except, next slide, <clears throat> for this. This is, when you're trying to understand, this, everything about irrevocable trust has to do with this line from that section. 42 U.S.C. 1396 P.D. 3B small i says that regarding irre irrevocable trusts, right, Quote, if there are any circumstances under which payments from the trust could be made to or for the benefit of the individual, and I just left dot, 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 in that situation, whatever could be paid under any circumstances to the individual is countable, right? Not all the trust assets, but all those trust assets, they are countable. Now, the reason why I mention that is that, that you know, people, would, there are a lot of lawyers for a long time that have tried to cook up trusts that allow you to have your cake and eat it too, that allow you to set this money up and put it into an irrevocable trust, but the lawyer's going to say, oh yeah, but you know, really, you still have control, right? Well, recently, or fairly recently, there was a case in Massachusetts, there have been some others in other parts of the country, which basically said, uh, no, you can't do that. And I'm going to just give you some examples. Next slide. So, <clears throat> if the trustee of the trust, who, by the way, who shouldn't be you. I've heard lawyers also say that, that you can be the trustee of your own irrevocable trust. No, no, because then effectively you still have control over those assets and therefore a way of figuring out how to get them back to you. Suppose that one of your kids is the, tr is the, is the trustee, but you can borrow money from the trust. Or there's just this broad section that says that the trustee can make loans and doesn't specifically exclude you, right? Well, in that case, under any circumstances, you could get the money back. Because, by the way, there is a case in Massachusetts that says that to the extent that the trustee has any discretion to give you money, any discretion to give you money, that money is countable. In addition to, because that counts as one of those ways through which you could get the money back, okay? So if the trust can loan you money, it's countable. How much of it is countable? Well, if they can loan you all the money, then all of it is countable. Um, if Mary's the trustee, not Mary Jr. here, if Mary was the trustee, no. Um, what about early dissolution? There is often a provision in these trusts that says that if the, trust, uh, if, if the trustee determines that it is no longer economically practicable to con continue the trust, well then um, the, the trustee can dissolve the trust. And that's designed for the classic situation where you've got a trustee who's being paid money to run the trust and you've got a trust that's got like $100 left. Right? And so you just say, well, this is stupid. You know, we just obviously have to close out the trust. Well, there was this recent case, it was called Doherty, in which 
the, 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 the lawyer, being clever, said, well, well, I'll do some, put some language in there that says that the trustee can determine uh, to terminate the trust at any time, uh, except that, that that decision is totally in the discretion of the trustee. There is no standard set up regarding why the trustee can determine that the trustee, it's impractical to keep the trust, right? And the court said, nah, no, <laughs> this was, and literally said, this was a very cleverly drafted trust to leave the, the beneficiary in control. So that kind of provision can knock your trust out. What about control over distributions? I've heard this done, right? I've heard, I've seen trusts in which the older person who has set up this irrevo irrevocable trust, except that no distribution can be made out of that. C distributions can be made to his children in that case, or her children. But no distribution can be made unless the trustee agrees to the distribution. And the distribution, and the trustee can actually order distributions to be made to the son or the daughter, right? And I've heard lawyers say, well, see, see, you still have control of the money. So if you really need the money, well, you can just tell the, the trustee to distribute to the son or the daughter, you know, and you're going to get the money right back. The court said, no, <laughs> no that's, that just means that there is a way in which you can really get the money. And finally, there's the house issue. There is a debate among lawyers regarding the house issue. The safe way to deal with transferring the house into the irrevocable trust is to keep a life estate in the property, to keep a life estate in the property, to keep that amount of control so you're not deeding the whole house to the trust. There are a number of trusts in which the entire interest in the property was deeded to the trustee, but, the tr but there's a rule in the trust that says, well, the house can be maintained by the trustee for the benefit of the older person, right? Well, the court in this one case said, well, you know, if, if, you know what is a house, right? I mean, while, while the, the trustee is, or the, the, the older person isn't entitled to any income from the house, and when the house gets sold, the, 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 the older person isn't uh, entitled to any money from the house. But the court basically said, so what's a house? A house is a place where you live. So if a trustee's got the house, but you have the right to live in it forever, right? Well, then effectively, the, the, you still own the house, right? And therefore, it's still countable. So these are things that you just want to be careful about if you're doing an ir irrevocable trust. Next slide. Now, I'm, once again, I'm going to go briefly back to this Frank and Mary case. Remember. And we've talked about this before, but remember, if you're Frank and Mary right now and you're not seeing Alzheimer's over the next five years, right, hopefully, right, one of the things you can do is just keep everything. You can keep everything. You want to make sure that each of your wills says that upon your death, everything goes to your surviving spouse, or everything goes not to your surviving spouse directly, but in trust for the benefit of your surviving spouse. If you structure your assets that way and make sure that whoever dies first, all the assets are in that person's name, then when that person dies, the surviving spouse's assets are all safe. There's no five-year look-back period on this, so you can actually write the wills to do that right now, keep control of your assets, knowing that if one of you dies, all the assets are safe for the benefit of the surviving spouse. Next slide. Um, so what you need to do is, if you want to do that kind of protection, make sure all assets are in individual names. This, the trust or this will only affects assets that someone dies owning. If you own something jointly with your spouse, then even if you, though you have this terrific will, upon your death, your spouse becomes the owner of the assets, which means they're exposed, which means they're stuck to the, with the five-year rule. Um, so you want a will that has this testamentary trust that we just talked about. Um, the trustee has, would have the ability to distribute, in that case, some or all of the assets to the spouse without the money thereby becoming countable. That's the, the difference between that and the, the standard irrevocable trust rule. And then you want to make sure that you've done powers of attorney so that each of the two spouses, somebody has the ability on their behalf to transfer assets. So if it turns out that one of the spouses is dying, you can make sure that all the assets can get shifted to that spouse so that following his death, everything is protected for the benefit of the other spouse. So that's what you can do kind of early on. Next slide. So what about this kind of situation number two? I get these calls too, but they get them more, right? Uh, and that's why Susan's going to be talking more about this one, right? But Susan, but actually, Susan and Tim, you're going to be talking about, so what, ha what happens if, you know, you forgot the keys again to the car and you can't, you can't find them, you know? Is, it, is this it? You know, is this the beginning of the end, right? So we're just going to talk about 
kind of what early symptoms look like and kind of what you do to distinguish them. Whoever wants to talk. <laughs> <laughs>